All right, everyone. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, to talk about mobile produce market. Um, I have with me um, Max Culp, who is the co-founder and COO of The Best Route. And my name is Frédéric Laforge, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of The Farmer's Truck. Uh, so today, uh, Max, you want to say hi real quick? I'm sure, yeah. Uh, first and foremost, Fred and The Farmer's Truck, thanks for having us out here today. Uh, but like Fred mentioned, my name is Max Colt. I'm uh, with The Best Route, and uh, we are basically a team of uh, former mobile market operators turned consultants. Uh, so now we're helping a lot of new mobile markets who are uh, kind of just getting um, off the ground starting, uh, do some of that program design, that lift at the beginning end, as well as doing some evaluation projects, things like that, or anything in between. Um, this season also, we are now piloting a mobile market in our own community. So we're putting a lot of those best practices uh, out there to kind of the model and uh, show off and share with the community. So hope and, to share with you all. And this is a brand new mobile market that you've just uh, launched maybe three months ago, roughly? Um, yeah, so we are doing a 12-week pilot here. Uh, so we are working within the growing season here in Southeast Pennsylvania, uh, basically ending uh, the second half of the season here. Um, so we're basically going right up into uh, uh, sorry, th into Thanksgiving here. And um, yeah, no, so we'll have a lot of lessons learned here. And we basically kind of bootstrapped it with tables and tents. Um, and um, I think we can show a, uh, a model where it may not take a large investment to really get started uh, with your produce yeah. market, let's say. Yeah, you can start pretty affordable if you want to. Um, all right, so real quick, some housekeeping. So take your uh, notes and questions. You can drop them in the chat, but at the end, we'll do a Q&A. So any questions you have throughout the conversation, please put it in and we'll revise it at the end. <clears throat> if you're feeling like you're sociable today, well, you know, hashtag farmer's truck, just, you know, put it out there that we're talking about mobile produce market and uh, hashtag farmer's truck, please. Uh, and thank you for joining. So let's begin. So what we'll cover today is what are mobile farmers market? You know, mobile produce market, mobile farmers market. So me and Max are always talking about what's the right definition of it. In California, they're talking about mobile farmers market as an extension of their farmers market. Some other places is a bit different. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about how to start a mobile farmers market and we will cover the new community learning platform. So let's start with the basics. So what are mobile produce market? Well, like Max was just mentioning, it does not have to be complicated. It could be literally a cart and that's it. So here is one of the famous program, actually a program that we're working with to redesign their cart, uh, but it's called a New York City green cart. And so um, straightforward, it's a cart. You put your fruits and vegetable on it. You are mobile, you can move it around and you are a mobile market in, in that sense. Um, like Max is doing right now, um, your mobile market can be also tents and table, but all, with a vehicle. So you can have a refrigerated van or just a regular van, but you know it does not have to be more complicated than that. Uh, you obviously have the farmer's truck, which is a, design, a vehicle specifically designed for mobile produce market programs so that when you get on location, you can quickly open up, serve your customers and wrap things up. And then you have a bus, which is really the kind of all the models that we've seen. There's, you know, some in between, but these are the typical model that we've seen as far as mobile market. And it goes from a complex bus that needs all kinds of different uh, maintenance and support to a little cart on the side of the street that doesn't have to be more complicated. So a little bit about us. So Farmer's Truck, we started in 2015 to bring fresh food, uh, local food to our underserved community. And now we teach others to do the same. So how we do that? We, by providing a key in hand mobile produce truck, uh, by helping organizations raise funds and to launch their program. And we also provide holistic support. <clears throat> so we're really always trying to figure out how to support mobile market program operators and holistically, what is the barrier and how do we make it easier for them to do this and, and be more sustainable? And this is one of the reasons why we launched a community learning platform. So how to start a mobile produce market? Let's dive in. So key considerations. And, you know, we had to boil it down because we only have a, a small webinar. There's a lot to talk about. So if you want to dig deeper, there's the community learning platform. We have our modules and you can see and learn about, read and learn about all of these different things. But right now, really, it's understanding your community needs. So who needs to be served? Who's already playing in that, not playing, but who's already serving that community? Trying to understand 
who's there and how can you complement or bridge the gap between what's already available, the type of partnerships you need. So where are you going to park? And the city, maybe the city needs to get involved for you to have a, a better parking situation and things like that. The county sometimes. Um, your suppliers, where are you getting your stuff? Is it farmers? Is it a wholesaler? Is it maybe a partnership between a grocery store? You know, what are the best practices? We'll talk a bit about the business model. So there's different business models and different funding um, options and how people go at it to launch a mobile market program. And then we'll talk a bit about the vehicle and equipment you need. And so let's go directly to understanding your community. And Max, I know that uh, we've talked about this a little bit yesterday, so maybe I'll let you kind of chime in on that one. But basically, what is the need? When you're trying to think, hey, I know my community has some food deserts, lack of access in some places. How do you go at it? Um, absolutely. So like one of the first things whenever you're looking at how you want to evaluate the situation, what the landscape really looks like. Uh, so one of the first places, if you guys already aren't kind of the the ones gathering that data on your community already, who has it? So a lot of uh, the first places you might uh, want to look are looking at different community foundations as well as different uh GIS data, things like that, where you can identify where those physical gaps are in your community, where there might be a lack of geographic access to fresh, local, affordable produce, um, and really identifying where folks are already accessing, whether it's through the grocery store, if there's a pantry system in place, uh, the charitable food versus uh, some more of the retail options, and understanding what those barriers might be. Um, are, is there any kind of public transportation in your community? Can you map that out and understand that uh, while there's a high need community on uh, one side of town, there's uh, might be some kind of geographic or physical barrier stopping folks from accessing uh, fresh food. Um, so when you kind of see those uh, patterns kind of present themselves, you can use that data uh, to really identify where your market could be and be the most impactful. Um, and at the same time, that's a good way to identify who are your key partners. So like Fred mentioned, is there a grocery store that you can partner with that's already kind of servicing that area? Can you do some buying with them? Is there a pantry that has a clientele that might benefit from what you're bringing um, that might uh, have SNAP access? So using these different mapping and identifying not only the different food resources, but um, who are the other different players in town that can really support your mobile market um, to be effective and sustainable? Yeah, I mean, and we also talk about like the community asset mapping, which is really trying to understand like what is happening in my community, because sometimes we have an assumption of what's happening. And, you know, we don't really know that the, the your, your food bank is already doing a lot of work when it comes to some food access program and some food access program are emergency free food access program. There's always a need and a time for that. But maybe there's some, an opportunity to complement that with a more of a market style, uh, like affordable fresh food model. And so they already are buying fruits and vegetable. Maybe you can work with them on that. Maybe take some some of that work off your plate, collaborate, work together, I think is is kind of the key. And understanding who is already working on that is a big deal. So you want to do that first. Um, so who's already serving the community? And then strategic partners for success. So um, my two cents on that, and maybe Maxi can uh, dive in there after that, but basically your strategic partners are your parking location because they basically, you know, you're going to put a lot of energy and money and time to make sure people show up at your market. You have maybe 10 locations a week that you're doing, maybe more, maybe less. Every location requires its own marketing effort to make people show up and make sure they show up. Um, if you're doing all that work and all of a sudden this this partner pulls out, ah, you know what, I don't want the mo mobile market here anymore. You gotta, you gotta go, I don't want you here anymore. You need to have some sort of a really strategic partnership agreement in place and all that stuff. And Max, I know you have a story about that. Maybe you can <laughs> share that real quick. Um, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll, I, I can uh, chime in real quick with that. We basically had a very successful uh, mobile market. We're about four or five seasons into a specific location. Um, and then um, that physical location we were at uh, had a new property manager come in. Um, that new property manager no longer saw value in us being in their empty parking lot. Um, so as a result, they asked us to leave, unfortunately. Um, so we had to scramble. We had 30 days. Uh, fortunately, we had 30 days, basically, though, uh, to find a new location because in our written agreement uh, that we had stated previously with the original uh, property managers, um, that at least gave us a grace period to find a new host location, which fortunately there was a church just across the street within eyesight. 
So we were able to kind of move our market right over there. Thank goodness we're mobile in that fashion. Um, and then we were able to, like I said, had to use that month to communicate with our uh, customers, our different partners in the area that there was a change in place and um, just kind of explain the rationale for that. Yeah. Um, so, that so that really goes a long way, kind of uh, having a strong partner in that fashion. It and sometimes like, you know, having visibility when you're parked and so people can see you from the street when they're passing by or whatever is super important. So sometimes you lose that aspect and you're like, people are not showing up in the market because they don't even know I'm there. Like I'm almost hiding in, in plain sight, you know, so very important to find a strategic partner for success. And that includes also your, um, oh, James, you have a question. I should just mention somebody just asked if uh, this will be recorded. So it will be recorded and it'll be available on our YouTube channel for viewing at a later time. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. All right. So uh, we were talking about uh, now uh, partnerships and suppliers. And so I guess we just talked a bit about that, but I mean, where do I park is a big, is a good question, right? So if you're thinking about doing a mobile market, we talked about, mapping out your community, understanding where the gaps are, where are the grocery stores, where is the lack of grocery stores, where's the density, if you're targeting low income, low access communities, who they are, where where are they located, how how what was the best place to park in that in that area. Very, very important. And you'll notice that sometimes you go ahead, Max. I'd just like to chime in on that. Um, when you're looking at where to park, you also want to consider when you're parking there. Uh, so certain clientele are going to be more receptive to your market in the uh, morning hours. So if you're looking to target more of a senior population, then the earlier hours, if you're going to a site like that. But if you're looking for more of a general public where you might be, say, like a, a convenience store or something like that, you're on a major throughway uh, after work uh, might be more possible. So kind of the when and the where are super important when you're developing these relationships. Um, just like if there is already going to be clientele, are you working with the community organization? Do they have customers coming in already? How do you work together and really be beneficial for everyone? And, and being parked on the right side of the road based on the time of day. So when people are going out of the city, you're trying to catch that traffic. When people are going in the city really early morning, I don't know that people are actually shopping in the morning, but basically when coming back from home, that that's usually a, a, one of our highlights when we were doing our own market It's when we sold a lot, a lot of products. Um, so who helps with community engagement? So this is, uh, you know, when you are targeting low income, low access communities and you're trying to build trust, you're trying to build, you, you want to be invited in, right? So uh, if you just show up with a truck and you're like, hey, I'm doing this now, I mean, it's just uh, the reception might not be as great as you think. But if it's introduced by a partner that's already working uh, in the area or it's already doing some work in the area and it's slowly introduced that way, then people tend to have a better engagement. Uh, Max, I don't know if you had. Uh... Yeah, to add on to that a little bit, um, something that uh, has been pretty um, obvious this year is really kind of finding who those gatekeepers are in, in your communities. Um, so having those honest conversations with your customers and kind of uh, developing that rapport with them. Um, and kind of in respecting what they say, if they have advice, implementing something, if they orient something one way versus the other, um, if they ask for a certain item, hey, can you start carrying sweet potatoes? Sure. Um, so if you can implement things um, and kind of put customers feedback into practice quickly, the, the community is more likely to engage with you and, and believe that you are uh, there for the right reasons and, and, want, and want to help and not so much there to make a buck and you're not there in a predatory fashion. Yeah, they really encourage you and they will show up. And sometimes, uh, you know, we know some programs are able to work with community ambassadors. So there's every place where they park, they'll have someone in the community that's been either uh, chosen or, or you know, volunteered or were selected to be the community ambassador. And their job is really to get the community to come to the mobile market and to build that trust and just to kind of socialize it and be there. And sometimes like, uh, you know, they'll they'll do a bit more. They'll talk about, Sometimes there's even a remuneration, like they'll, they'll be paid to do it. So um, where do I get the food? I mean, you know, am I dealing with small farmers? Am I dealing with wholesalers? My two cents on that. I grew up on a farm, love farmers. But when you're a farmer and you are a small farmer specifically, uh, you need to sell your product at a decent price in order to make ends meet. It's not like you're this big wholesaler uh, you know, and you can move a lot of food and you have great pricing. So encouraging local farmers is something that I hold dear to my heart. But when it comes to choosing your battles, making food accessible to the community you're trying to, to reach and make that food accessible to them is your priority. And so when you are 
doing your procurement, you want to make sure you have great deals that people feel like this is a really, this is worth their time to show up because they have great deals. The pricings are great, but also you want to encourage local when you can. So if it's, if it's a peach season and then, you know, maybe you buy a lot of peaches, maybe if it's, if the strawberries are uh, in season and there's a great price on it, then you buy strawberries, whatever you can find local. People love local food, but it's just, you need to pick between, you know, making your price affordable or encouraging local and, one or the other needs to win. Sometimes. And I think just to, to that point, I think it's important for any kind of new market or anyone who's kind of continuing their markets to really be serious and have like a sourcing ethos and ethics behind it and understand what you value, uh, who you're going to partner with and what that dollar you can really invest in it. Uh, because if you're an organization that has that potentially nonprofit that can do some grant funding to support local farmers and you have access to grant dollars, that's very different than another program who might not have access to that. They may have to do be more dollars and cents focused. Um, so not saying one model is better than the other. They're just realistic to what your community um, needs in the moment and what the resources that are available to y'all. Yeah, yeah, it it it, um, it really does. And sometimes I was thinking too, like if you're a really small program, and let's say you have a local grocery store that's independent that wants to do community work and 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 do some good in the community have a chat with the owner, you know, listen, I'm going to do this. Maybe can I buy from you? And you already have a purchasing power as a, as a grocery store. I just want to buy a few cases of this and that, you know, and be able to maybe even work from the grocery, like be able to park the vehicle and store some stuff. Like there's all kinds of different partnerships. If you think uh, from a procurement standpoint, there's, there's some options out there. So for you to explore and make the best out of it. Uh, all right, so uh, topic number three, that's a mistake. Topic number three, <laughs> business model and funding. So what are the models? What are mo mobile market programs are actually putting out there? So we've seen there's all kinds of needs, right? You design your program based on who you're trying to help. So you kind of reverse engineer, you know, for example, we have communities in the Central Valley in California they have a lot of, uh, you know, undocumented individuals they work with. For them, it's a don't ask, don't tell policy. They bring, you know, diapers. They'll bring a hygiene product. They'll bring food, obviously, some dry goods, shelf-stable stuff, because that's the need, and that's how they're they're catering to it. Um, if you're doing a, um, if you're trying to be, you know, focused on fruits and vegetable, and you're trying to be uh, sustainable in your in your program. Well, charging for the food is, is really important. It also brings dignity to the process. Um, and there's all kinds of models in between where you have pay what you can. You can have a, there, I've seen, I've heard some with chip systems. I've heard some that are, you know, some food banks are doing a, a numbered or a colored dot. Uh, you can pick two of this, one of this or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of different models. But the one that we preach in our community learning platform is the one that balances financial sustainability and social impact. And so we like to say, uh, wear the mask, I like, the, I like in the airplane, wear the mask first before you start helping others. Well, if you have a program that relies heavily on grant funding to continue the work, it just puts a risk on your program and all the effort and sweat and equity that you've put in um, to you know, uh, be sustainable for the long term. So. It depends on how you see things. There's always a need for emergency food assistance, but sometimes uh, complementing that might be actually a better uh, option. So, Max? Yeah, uh, it really just kind of goes down to who you're trying to serve and why. Um, and I think a lot of the business models go back to, or like um, I always kind of promote a, a market model where there is a, a dignified exchange. The customer is purchasing uh, the product in some meaningful way. Um, and then it really comes down to how your organization wants to offset that. Um, are you willing to subsidize that, like Fred said, through uh, the grant fund? Or are you going to uh, create value-added products to then generate more revenue so that your market is financially sustainable? So there's a number of different kind of options. Uh, across the spectrum and it really comes down to what makes sense for you and and what what will meet the need and when we talk about food insecurity food access uh people who have been marginalized disenfranchised people who have, have lost trust in the system when you're trying to rebuild that you're trying to say listen be normal like i'm offering you a normal experience here which is just like a market experience you come here you buy food but it turns out the food is super affordable you go home, you're raving about it, and the next week you're coming back. 
So from a program adherence and a program success standpoint, a program that sells its food will have better adherence, have better participation. Um, it, it's, you know, the, 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 the uh, feedback we're getting and anecdotal feedback we're getting is that this seems to be the right model. Now, there's always a place for other models. I pay what you can, I pay forward, all kinds of different models. But at the end of the day, we want people to feel like they're not participating in a, 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 poor, people, a poor people program, I guess, or, or like the special bus. No, it's not a special bus. Everybody gets to participate, whether you're rich or poor, you get to have fresh fruits and vegetable, accessible, healthy, and so that it creates an inclusive environment. And that's what we preach. Um, so how do we fund this? Max, what, where, where do you start? What, what would be, you know, you take it away. Um, so, so I guess just at, when you're starting from, from ground zero, so I'll share a little bit, I guess, my, my own experience from this year. Uh, that is needing a vehicle. That is going to be one of the first areas uh, that folks kind of think about when you think about the mobile market um, is how you're actually going to get the food into the community. So for us, it was kind of identifying how we could uh, do that. So um, trying to think like, uh, so we basically were able to finance basically by, by, our, by our vehicle, have our storage space. And we were able to then uh, basically we worked with local growers, source our food uh, with wholesalers. And that is basically how we are operate, operating our 12 weeks, our 12 week pilot. Um, we are accepting multiple forms of payment. So we accept the farm market nutrition program checks. So that is a form of payment, uh, government assistance here in Pennsylvania that lower income seniors can accept as well as uh, participants on WIC. Uh, we are in position to take SNAP dollars. Uh, we also uh, were able to solicit funding uh, through ARPA funding, uh, given the timing of everything. And that allowed us to provide uh, financial incentives into the community. So that way it really reduced the uh, the cost in which folks had to actually uh, put dollars out of their pocket, but they were still purchasing and still bringing funds into our program. Um, so we were able to find basically real dollars out there for our customers to then purchase pro uh, product for us. Um, so we weren't able necessarily to find operating uh, funding, things like that, uh, but we were able to find a uh, how to fund a truck, which tends to be a lot easier. And then we uh, basically worked our model to find dollars uh, for our customers to then offset the uh, food cost. Yeah, and I would say that um, when you're thinking about your model and let's say we're picking the market pay, the paid model where you're selling the food at an affordable price. When you're fine tuning your model and you're thinking, well, I need to make X amount of revenue for everything I'm selling in order to make my ends meet. Well, maybe your your operating expense uh, and the way you're generating some income, maybe it just covers the food. And maybe for the rest of the operation, you need to kind of fundraise a little bit every year. And so that your, your product stays affordable, accessible. Um, and a great partner for these type of things is the city that you're in or the county that you're in, right? So there's a lot of interest in um, serving these underserved communities and making sure that, you know, connecting with them. And there's also um, complementary services that can be added to a program. So a good example I like to bring up often is in Louisiana, their mobile market program, for example, we work with they um, they, they do a, a, they bring a nurse once in a while and they'll do eye exams and they'll talk about um, you know, diabetes and, and things like that. In uh, California, they'll bring representative of, of CalFresh and they'll talk about maybe trying to do some um, uh, signing up people for, uh, you know, some program. So it all of these aspects that because you get to go into a community where it's often hard to reach and maybe hard, often hard to kind of build a relationship with, well, you're creating that space where uh, people can do that. And so that's worth something. And so you know, the city, like, try to find partners that um, would have a, an interest in paying for this. It also is a, a great way. Just to kind of add on a little bit more to what Fred was saying there in the same vein, uh, WIC agencies tend to be uh, very much in line with that since they do have the dollars and uh, basically for your clientele to then spend with you. Um, and they and they always need that touch point. Um, so they need to check in anyway. So if folks are able to do it in the community, it's really a win-win for everybody. Um, and then what was the other follow-up to that? Um I'm blanking, so we'll come back to that. But oh, okay, if you remember, that's all good. Yeah. And also, there's a little call to action here that says "need funding." Essentially, that brings a, that brings you to our website. There's a form. Uh, we do grant search for organizations all the time, and we want to accompany you through that. So, if you're considering doing a mobile market, please reach out, and we'll try our best to help you get that off the ground. Uh, just wanted to mention that. 
All right, so let's talk real quick about how we're doing on time. So two thirty, okay. So um, that's perfect. So we'll glide. We'll, we'll glide. We'll, we'll glide through uh, these five uh, five pieces of equipment. So all right, Max, um, table intent. What's the pros? What are the cons? Um, so table intent is probably going to be your easiest way to get out there and operate. Um, it's simple. You can go to almost any store. You can find a table tent, basically operate and get out there and uh, get going. Uh, the biggest drawbacks is that it's labor intensive. Uh, so your setup time is now going to be extra. Your cleanup time is now going to be extra. So you have to kind of account for that in your day. Um, so as a result, uh, when we do a table and tent setup, uh, typically it's not realistic to do more than two markets in, in a day. Unless they're setting up really, really close to each other, you just don't have enough bandwidth in the day. Uh, but that is not to say it shouldn't be a reason to stop you uh, from getting out there. Like like you, like you like I shared, that's how we started this year um, because it was important just to get out there in the community, trial it, test it, see how the community reacted to it. Um, and it's it's a low price point way to enter. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. You just have to have make sure you get good produce, figure out your pricing, make sure people show up at your at your market so it's like selling tickets to a show you need people to show up and you got to think about it that way you're kind of putting an event once a week in a certain location that's uh, you're selling sh tickets to the show um all right uh I, I see that there's more comments but we'll circle back on that uh okay so trailer i guess is a bit of a, an upgrade from the tent and table um, yeah, so with the trailer, what, what um, I, I enjoy just basically because then folks, it's the setup is a little bit easier in your respect, but then it, the, one of the main drawbacks and challenges operationally uh, comes into needing a secondary vehicle. Um, and then with a secondary vehicle, you need competent driver. And with competent drivers comes um, high, higher pay wage, and it just comes more challenging uh, having those individuals. So while a trailer uh, might be an easy way to kind of get going also, um, I don't necessarily always advocate for it because of those other operational challenges that typically a lot of organizations who operate these mobile farmers markets, uh, whether that be a, a through the health system, a food bank, um, typically don't have those skill sets, whereas um, a farmer or someone a little more on the food system side, uh, the trailer system might be more applicable and an easier lift. And and a lot, not a whole lot of people exactly and volunteers to drive around a trailer in a busy city. It's, it's a bit nerve wracking. So yeah, I mean, there's the comfort level and how, you know, employee and wellness and and satisfaction this is a big deal with these programs. It takes a lot of energy. The people you'll find to do this, like Max and others, are you know runs on different types of batteries than most. And uh, you know you want to carry the better environment for them to to to, to thrive and 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 be great at what they do, which is connecting with the community and you know doing all that. So um, the van truck, which is kind of the same thing as what you're doing, Max, but you have the truck and then you set up the tents and tables. Uh, so it's like you know instead of the hauling, now you have it all in one piece. Yep, and the only addition to that really is that uh, we're now able to have uh, refrigeration. So we have cold storage on the truck now, so we can travel with active refrigeration, active freezer space now, as well as hot water and hand sinks. So that allows us to do food demonstrations in the community, as well as carry a more uh, larger variety of product. Um, and to that point, now carrying the eggs and possibly meat, that's where you have items with a better margins usually than your fruits and the veggies. Um, so that's how we're able to kind of keep some items more affordable uh, while having some other higher markup um, items available. Um, farmer's truck. So I'll, 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 I'm the biased one here. So I'll talk about farmer's truck. Farmer's truck is just an extension of that thought process, which is like, Hey, we were doing the mobile market. We saw that, you know, it is challenging to set up a market one, twice a day with tents and tables and, and putting it out there. And so having something that's easy, quick, you, you show up on site, you open up the side door, you pull out the drawers, here you go. You're ready to serve the customer. It, you know, you need to prep ahead of time um, but um, that's really the main uh, highlight of the farmer's truck and a few other things but really it's uh, if you're trying to do more sites if you're doing three four sites a day you will need a better tool to do that type of stuff but then you are maximizing the impact you're having in your program um, it, it is a hustle you know adding doing four markets a day is is a you know it's a hustle but um, yeah so that's the farmer's truck in a nutshell and then let's talk about the bus. Uh, Max, do you have any, um, you don't have any experience with a bus. Um, so we never actually operated one, but we went and visited a number of them. So I've, I've seen some of the pros and the cons. Um, I, I can speak in that respect, but if you have firsthand experience, please share. Well, I mean, from a, a 
there's two there's two sides, right? There's the operator's side and then there's the customer's side. So on the customer side, they get to have a closed environment. So you can, you know, make sure it's uh, the right temperature. If it's really warm outside or cold, you can create that space, right? Um, it does have tons of space inside. So if you're designing like the photo we were looking at, when you have all the produce on, on both sides, you have a lot of uh, windows, so it's well lit. Uh, there's a lot of, of, um, of good that comes out of that model, but it comes with a, a slew of challenges. And this is feedback that I'm getting from the different programs. Um, hard to fix. I mean, it's a specialty piece of equipment. It requires a big garage to, to, to go in and to be lifted or whatever. Um, oftentimes when the city decides, hey, you want to have a city bus? I mean, I'll give you a city bus. Uh, well, the reason that is, is because that city bus is, is should be, you know, uh, given away, not given away, but is out of the fleet because it's no longer really viable for them to run it. So then you end up with all these problems. And some programs that we've talked to, they budget 10, 15K a year just in repair. So imagine when you're starting your program and you already have a $15,000, $20,000 repair bill every year that you have to, to, to put up with. I mean, that hits quite a bit on your sustainability for the program. So the easier the the easier it is, uh, the less things I can break, the more sustainable your program is. So, And like to that point, if you're an organization that is willing to fix things yourself, you'll save a lot of time and energy. If you have that skill set, um, I know that's kind of far and few between, um, but having folks, uh, an operator who can troubleshoot and understand some of these uh, mechanical issues, challenges that you're going to operate on the road, um, it's a huge asset. So finding that is a challenge, but finding an operator who can do a lot of that for you um, will save you guys a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, there's always something. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a work tool. You need to get familiar with it. Uh, we know we are uh, the farmer's truck. We have different models. Some are learning, running on lithium batteries. Some are running on ice packs. You have pros and cons. Um, you, you know, pick your battles, I guess. But at the end of the day, you have to get to be the master of your tool. It's like a, you're a painter and this is your brush, right? So you have to kind of learn how to use it and, and get better. And, you know, I, how many times I had to go and drive because we forgot, uh, one of the staff members forgot to close the light and then the battery was dead and I had to go and charge the truck on the side of the road. I don't know how many times because, you know, this is something you learn uh, through trial and error, I guess. And, uh, yeah. All right. So, finally, the unveiling of the community learning platform. Some of you might have heard that, you know, we've been... Uh, teasing it. We've been uh, sending some uh, information about it uh, since uh, ba basically late summer. But uh, yeah, we're going to cover today a quick demo and, and of the community learning platform. So the community learning platform overview. Um, so why did we create the platform? Um, essentially, we saw that the main challenge with mobile market programs it's not about finding people and individuals who wants to do this because there's a lot of people who see the need in their community and there's a lot of community champions and that care about the community and wants to take that on. So that seems to be a no brainer. Is there um, uh, money to do this? Yes, there is some money to do this. It's not as straightforward as you would hope, but there's more, more uh, eyes on the food is medicine movement. There's all kinds of different things coming and funding for these type of programs should get better with time. Um, What's really challenging is how you, what type of program you design. And we've heard many programs that started and then three, four years down the road, the funder um, decided to change their mind or said, you know what, it's time to kind of fly on your own. And you're like, well, my whole program is designed around the money you're giving me for this to make sense. So now I have to rethink my whole model. Well, a lot of them would not and just basically shut down the door and that all that effort, time and energy that was invested in that community to build these bridges, to build that trust is gone. And so what we think forward, uh, thinking forward about which model we would like to, to, to put forward and, and to the, for the community to kind of embrace, if you will, or kind of uh, at least uh, be inspired by. Um, and that's why we created the community learning platform. And so we went from literally the ground up uh, worked with Max, with Roberto at Best Route. We worked with others and feedbacks and all that stuff. Basically, at the end of the day, we took all our thoughts about building a program from A to Z from launching. 
Uh, there's still a module we're working on, module eight, but basically module one to seven are all in the platform and you can learn from procurement to, you know, community asset mapping to all kinds of different activities. There's files you can download, budgeting files, all kinds of things. So, um, and who is it for? Well, it's for those who are operating mobile market program. It's also for those who are curious about mobile market program. So, if you've been trying to find someone in your community that's been doing it or want to have maybe some mentorship, maybe there's someone in the platform. Um, so I'll, I'll show the uh, um, community chat part of it. But um, yeah, and you can go and, down, and, and use the QR code and, and go uh, play around with it. All right, so let me do a demo. All right, so. Okay. A lot of Q&A. I love it. I will get back to you guys after this. We're almost done. All uh, right. Uh, okay. All right. So the community learning platform really is two main things. One of them is we want you to learn. And one of them is we want you to be a community. So uh, there's been a lot of trial and error in the past about trying to create a mobile market community from a Facebook group to a LinkedIn group to uh, the Google group. Um, we're thinking that all these conversations should be online and accessible to everyone who wants to take a look at it and chime in and, and offer their help or find resources that they, they, don't, they didn't know about. And so um, this is our mobile market university. So you have all the modules here. We talk about what's the culture of mobile market, where they're starting, why why this is becoming a new thing when it's been around probably since the Egyptian. Uh, a farm stand has been around for a long time, but why is it now back on the on 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 in the highlight or in the light, I guess, to 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 do food access programs? Um, the social enterprise model, what we've just discussed, the uh, community engagement, uh, community asset mapping and so on. So I invite you to come on the website and, uh, you know, read through it, see things in there that make sense to you, uh, things that you want to challenge, please do comment below. We want to hear from you because this is a living, breathing, um, you know, environment. It's designed to grow with the community. Um, and one thing that we really like about it is like, you know, you're just curious. I'm like, okay, what do I, how do I do merchandising or procurement or let's say merchandising? All right, merchandising, procurement and merchandising. You can go and check out demand, pricing, supply side. So let's say here we talk about demand. How do you understand demand? You know, what 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 do what does your community need? And so we go into details. We have um, you know, stories from the road. We talk about the magic number of 50. This all ties down to what we call our Robin Hood financial model, which is um, something you can learn about in this. Um, but really, whenever you have a question or you're thinking about something about your mobile market, I want you to just go, you know, community.farmerstruck.com and search for a keyword. And you'll find a topic about it somewhere in there. And you can uh, learn from it. You can also challenge it. You can do just create an account, put a comment, and and we'll, we'll, we're monitoring this. So um, and then there's the community forum. Now, there's not a whole lot in here. Our plan is to do uh, more community management in there. But if people start using, this is a forum. It's very easy. You just create a new topic. You know, what do I do with leafy greens? They keep going bad and I don't know how to deal with that. Okay, well, maybe uh, a lot of people have different ideas on how to fix that. So um, I uh, invite you to, to do that. And that is pretty much the demo. Uh, and then obviously you can get in touch with us, but that's uh, that's just a link. So, all right. And I'm just gonna share my screen one last time. Oops. There we go. All right. So, well, this is it for uh, the presentation. So we have about 50, 20 minutes left, 50 minutes left, 15 minutes left. Um, and uh, James, do you want to kick us off with uh, a few of the questions that uh, seems to be reoccurring or something? 
Sure, and thanks everybody for the, the great questions. So the first one here comes from Earl, uh, an urban farmer, one acre in town, looking to create something like this. I do a frame farm stand, considering farmer's market, how can you help? So from an urban farm perspective, so you're basically leveraging one acre and doing direct to consumer. And right now your main business model is, uh, is it a CSA box or something like that? Like you want to add that as a complimentary, uh, maybe I'm asking questions to a question. Maybe that's not how I should do this. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, as a farmer, you're, you know, my dad's a farmer. So when I tell him, listen, you want to get a farmer's truck, they're like, you crazy that amount of money. If I have that, I'm buying a tractor. And that's, and, and I don't blame farmers because at the end of the day, they're trying to make their work la less back, uh, back breaking, you know, and, and that, and farming is, is a tough gig. Um, I would say that for your needs, maybe a, a tent and table and a trailer might be the best. Uh, if you're, if you're used to hauling around a trailer or, um, and where to find your sites, uh, farmer's market are great. So you need to apply for that. It depends on where you're at. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. I think that, uh, might, uh, James, does that sound like a good answer? That sounds like a good answer to me. <laughs> uh, we've got quite a few to go through here. We've got 22. So, uh, I guess we'll go to the okay. next one so from Karen and, uh, Max, whenever you want to jump in as well, just, just let us know. Uh, the question from Karen is, how exactly did you finance the truck and storage space? So usually uh, the nonprofits we work with, they fundraise for the mobile market. So that's uh, it seems to be an easier thing to do when you can show physically what that mobile market is going to look like. It's a great story to tell. It's easy to socialize. That's usually how uh, they fund their uh, uh, mobile market programs with grants or big donors. Um, very few of them will finance it through a bank or something like that. So that doesn't seem to be uh, the, 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 the most case. Um, and then the last question was about storage. So, you know, depending on where you are, they are there is a refrigerated storage space you can buy uh, basically for a pallet. You pay for one pallet, it's a refrigerated space, and you get a key and you can go in and, and keep your stuff there. So that might be an option for you. It might not be an option for you. The other options would be collaborating with your local food bank or your local grocery store who already has a refrigerated space and you can store some stuff there. Uh, if you don't have that opportunity, there's uh, you know some walk-in fridge that you can buy some kits that you can put either inside your you know on your property or uh, in you know. Uh, and there's also some trailers that are refrigerated that you can just park somewhere, plug it in, and that becomes your walk-in fridge, but it's a trailer. So these these would be the options that I've seen. And, and I think, just real quick, I'll chime in on that. I think your storage options are going to be very much reflective of the food choices that you decide to carry, as well as your local health permitting and what they allow, what they dictate. Um, and that's going to basically reflect what that storage demand looks like. Perfect. Uh, this is from Jeff, and he's wondering what the baseline cost for the truck is. So our truck, so we have a trailer version now. We have a B model and a C model. So our, our, our range is between 110 to 240, roughly. And it depends on the options that you pick for, for the vehicle. Perfect. This question is talking about grant funding. So do you utilize grant funding for any of your startup costs? If so, were they regional or federal funds? We don't, uh, but uh, Max, maybe you want to. Yeah, I'll chime in there. So um, our model or our market is kind of a unique situation um, because we are, in essence, uh, providing a mobile market as a service for a local nonprofit. Uh, the local nonprofit um, had no mobile market beforehand. They were just growing food or not just growing food. They were producing food as well as doing some youth engagement. And they uh, had ARPA funding. Uh, so through the COVID relief money, uh, there was a lot of money for these food access projects. Uh, mobile markets were identified as something that uh, folks wanted to do, uh, but they didn't have the bandwidth. So we were able to basically leverage that uh, that funding stream at the time to then allow us as um, to basically buy and purchase the vehicle, build it out. Um, yeah. Awesome. Okay, uh, Earl has uh, run into an issue. Uh, Since our city land use zoning explicitly forbids farm trucks or truck farms, have you run into this issue in the past? 
I know. Well, Max says, and uh, I mean, in Pennsylvania, they used to be called hucksters. I've learned that not too long ago. So, uh, Max, you want to chime in? Um, yeah, basically, um, it's a challenge. Some towns are going to are going to love the idea. They're going to want you to come in and they're going to be very receptive. Um, other municipalities might not be so much. Uh, in your case, Earl, and in my case, I um, I actually had to go down to the uh, to town. I have given two different presentations to the entire council um, and basically kind of explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, excuse me, et cetera. Uh, they now have a, an additional permitting um, right up now for what exact for mobile markets now. So we now have a new guidance, et cetera. Um, so unfortunately, it's new in a lot of these areas. And if you want to do this, um, you might have to make that lift and, and try to re-educate folks and advocate for um, that access. And I'm going to do a quick plug for uh, there's um, there's some organizations out there. One of them that I'm thinking about is Pacific Legal. They're a nonprofit legal organization that fights for your rights to do good. And so and they basically saw that we were doing this and they reached out and they're like, you know, any mobile market they're having challenge. Their city's pushing back. And this is a this is a help you know program. Essentially, it's a. Um, there's there's potential legal ways you can move things. I don't know that necessarily the best way to approach this is to create more friction. We've had the exact same. Uh, we 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 operated we is a tri city uh, area and one of the the both uh, two cities were absolutely uh, you know embracing our program like come park right in front of city hall. We want you to to shine here. We love what you're doing. And the other city basically gave us a ticket <laughs> when we went to park there. So they were absolutely against uh, what we were doing. And there was no, uh, you know, I even sat down with the mayor and I was like, listen, this is what we're doing. You still want to say no to this? And he's like, yep. I'm like, well, this is, I guess that's what it is. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Raj has a question about oh, it. Sorry, okay, sure. oh, go ahead, Max. Yeah. Um, another thing, too, is if the city is fighting you, a lot of times private property, they can't say much. So if you can find an advocate who wants to partner with you and you could be off uh, in a private parking lot that's still accessible, that's that might be another avenue you could pursue. So Raj is asking for a breakdown of ballpark uh, launch expenses, uh, categories and amount, and ongoing operation expenses. So ballpark figures for that. Um, Max, maybe you can chime in, but if you want to have a financial model, a high level high fin financial model, uh, please go to our platform, search for the financial model and it's called Robin hood, but you'll see in there. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, Max, if you want to chime in. Um, yeah, no, honestly, that, that would be a, a, a good first place to, to look. Um, hold on here real quick. Though. I apologize. Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question real quick? I yeah. just lost it. Yes, yeah, for a ballpark. Uh, uh, right, sorry, to that point, yeah. I don't have the ballpark number. That, 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 was, that was my statement, basically. Um, right now, uh, like I said, mentioned earlier, we're in like that 12 week uh, pilot season. So hopefully by the end of November, uh, we'll have kind of our little white paper, our evaluation on what it looked like, um, all the inputs, what all the outputs looked like, what those lessons learned. Um, and that's something that if you do look back on the platform uh, by the month of December, you'll see that populated on there. Um, so we'll definitely kind of share those lessons learned um, once we have them there. I mean, your main cost is labor and product. So if you can handle it on your own and you're really good at procurement and making sure that you're not buying too much so that when you come back home, there's not a whole lot to deal with and you're buying every couple of days maybe because you have a live volume, you're able to bring enough people um, to your market, uh, then your main problem is going to be, uh, you know, how do I keep that up? Because, you know, they're, they're, you're going to be sustainable financially. You're going to make money. Uh, maybe you want to uh, complement the uh, the market with more staffing, you know, whatever. Like, what do you, what do, you do with your – if you think about it from a social enterprise lens, this profit is surplus. What do you do with your surplus? You know, do you, do you complement your mobile market with more products? Do you save up for a farmer's truck because they're great? You know, never know. What, what your goals are. <laughs> All right. We've got a, a good question here that comes up quite a bit. Uh, are most people accepting SNAP as a form of payment? Max? Um, I, I would, I, I, I assume so. I don't have the data on that, but I think you're dumb if you're not. Um, basically, it's a form of payment that folks have in their pocket. So you should be doing everything you can to make it easy for folks to, to spend their dollar with you. Um, so whether that's a SNAP, whether that's farm market check, um, is there healthcare benefits? What else do folks have to buy fruits and vegetables or whatever you are selling? Make it as easy as you can for folks. Um, to that point, 
becoming a snap retailer is not super easy, especially for mobile markets. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a new concept at that level. And depending on which agent you speak with um, when you're doing your FNS licensing, you'll have a vastly different experience, unfortunately. Um, but it is something uh, it is worth exploring. I think definitely pursuing in that way, not only just as an access point, but there's also different double up dollars, different finance to basically leverage that and bring additional dollars, different additional funding to support uh, your program. This next question is a bit of a follow-up actually on that. Um, they're looking for a suggestion of a POS system that can process both SNAP and WIC benefits. Max, is it toll, toll pay, toll pay? Um, that, that seems to be like the one catch-all solution that can pretty much do anything and everything right now. Um, uh, from my understanding, the WIC payment processing kind of goes state by state with uh, what, what you can work with, but the total pay, as long as you have an FNS license, um, you should be able to pursue that. Um, yes. Do you want to put the link, Max, uh, in the chat? Uh, because this is this is a pretty cool product. It does, uh, you know, saves you some time and having multiple machines and... Um, yeah, you want to go with the next one, James? Yeah, this one is from uh, Lila, and she is looking for recommendations of how to store produce. Because they recently started a mobile market, and they're having trouble keeping the produce from rotting quickly, moving from a hot tent to a cooler multiple times. I mean, Max, uh, but essentially the key is to whenever you get products, you want to be able to move it as quickly as possible. It's dying by the second. And moving it in and out, fresh, cold, all stuff that's not, you know, and some produce, tomatoes, they don't like necessarily cold. But, you know, when you get it shipped in a truck, it's all refrigerated and it gets cold. Sometimes you get strawberries and it was harvested because there's a bit of a mist or some, you know, maybe it was raining the day before and it didn't dry up all, all good. So that's going to rot in a couple of days, three days, stops. So, you know, the battle with food is not a, it, it, there is about, it is about longevity, like trying to extend the shelf life. It is about trying to keep it, but all produce have different temperature needs and humidity needs. And the, the real, the real key here is to buy just enough of what you need and buy often. So. Uh, and just we have, uh, go ahead, Max. I was just going to mention to his point there, just kind of limit the, the amount of time that the food is on the shelf when you're at displaying it, minimize the number of items you have, use elevation to create your display to still make it look full and bountiful, but maybe you don't need the 10 bunches of greens out there. You can get by with two or three and just kind of find that, that midpoint there. Perfect. It looks like we have about five minutes left and we have uh, up to 30 questions almost. So, and a lot of them are actually really good, positive comments. So thanks to everybody for that. Uh, we'll try to answer a few more, and the ones we can't answer, we'll definitely follow up with you individually to, to get those answers for you. We're following but, up uh, with everyone, absolutely everyone. Yeah. Here's a, a one from Pamela. So she's been looking and starting starting a market in her area, which has no access to groceries within 25 miles either direction. So she wants to do this to help her community, but also wondering if she can make a living off of it. Off of this, is this viable to make a living off? So if you look at the New York Green Card program, is essentially a entrepreneur program. It's for people who are looking for ways to make some money. Uh, you're in a situation where maybe this is what you know, selling fruits and vegetables. Yeah, people, people make money. Like farmers have been doing this for centuries. Um, it's a hustle. It's a hustle because you're dealing with uh, the, uh, you know, Mobile being mobile, so you don't have brick and mortar. So people, uh, you know, with brick and mortar, you pass by the grocery store every day. You know the grocery store is there. So when you think about, I need something at the grocery store, you think about that. It's hard to do that type of, um, I don't know, we'll call it brand or awareness about the mobile market because you just show up for a couple of hours every week in a community, you know. So you really have to do the extra work. Um uh, I forgot where I was going with this. Completely blanked out. Thank you, uh, ADHD. I'll chime in real quick to that. Um, I, th I think something uh, selling just fruits and vegetables is going to be a challenge. Uh, just like on that level, like it's going to be a hustle. Um, so if you're able to find some other value add items, um, are you able to make upsell something? Like what is that niche that you have? Uh, something our markets were always successful with were dry herb blends. 
Um, these are something that's rather affordable, easy to make, has a nice upsell margin, and then you're able to incorporate it with your art, with your vegetables and fruits that you're already selling and make folks enjoy it even more. Um, so what are these complementary items that you could possibly bring in to then, again, offset that? Because are you doing this as a business? Is this a social uh, enterprise or is this a charitable enterprise? I think those are kind of like the three buckets. And depending where you're at, you're going to each have different um that, that you're, you're going to kind of make that decision for each of your, yourselves based on that. And real quick, like our busiest month when we operated, we sold for $46,000 worth of fruits and vegetables. So that's one month. I mean, you can hustle. It depends on the marketing you're doing. It depends on the stuff you're going to be putting out. It depends on building up the, the community and the relationship. All right. Two more, two minutes. Yeah. So it looks like we probably have time for maybe two more questions and answers. Uh, this is actually two people from the same question. They're wondering if there are electric mobile market trucks. Uh, that's the dream. Um, right now, the world that's changing to electric is still in the motion of changing, especially the logistic world when it comes to the refrigeration system and all that stuff. So uh, it, it's going to take a bit of time. And China and other places are quite more advanced. Europe's quite more advanced in that space than we are in North America. So... Um, I'm hopeful that uh, in the next couple of years, we'll have an official electric mobile market truck to offer. Uh, and there's another one. There's the first electric mobile market truck uh, that I know of in North America is is uh, officially being launched sometime in uh, end of November. We're still waiting on the date, but it's in Canada. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. But uh, yeah. Perfect. And I guess the last question here is just... Uh... Can we assist in any way to write a grant proposal or to help with funding? Yes, absolutely. So here's how we do it. Uh, we will do grant search for you all day, all night. So basically, we'll sit down with you and we'll figure out a, a game plan on how to get this fundraising. And then you pick the grants that you think are the best matches for you. And then we assign you a grant writer and then you pay like the grant writer will figure out, okay, this is a USDA grant. It's a big, it's a big, it's a lot of work. So this is how much I want. But so you'll get a quote and then we'll do as many as we can. We'll just keep on. I mean, you want to, you put more grants out there than, you know, uh, that you need because you usually win maybe one out of two maybe or uh, so. Yeah, absolutely. We can help with that. So reach out. Okay, and I think that'll wrap it up for the questions for now. So I'll pass it over to Max and Fred. Awesome. Well, real quick, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Max, uh, you want to do a quick plug for Best Route and what you guys do real quick, and please people do reach out. Uh, to Max. Well, I'm sure, uh, thanks, Fred, for having us. Uh, like Fred mentioned, we're with the best route. Uh, I do uh, consulting mobile market services. So if you have any kind of program design, if you are kind of at this stage where you're evaluating, kind of reevaluating what your market might look like, um, if you see some operational challenges, kind of work through what that might look like. We just a variety of different uh, kind of wealth of knowledge within this mobile markets uh, realm, I like to think. So please reach out. Uh, we're at mobile markets, uh, mobile market consultants.com. Uh, we do 45 minutes free consult consultations. Um, so like Fred said, reach out, uh, we'll touch base there, or you'll see me on the platform chiming in here and there. So be well, everyone. Best of luck. All right. Well, thanks, Mac, for joining. Oh, there you go. We lost it. But thanks, Mac, for joining. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, if you want to launch a mobile market, reach out to us. We'll figure out a way to help you. And if if we can't help, Max can help. If they can't, you know, there's someone out there that we can connect you with that can hopefully help you organize and uh, put this together because we want to see fresh food accessible in every community. That is our mission. And so um, please join us in that crazy mission of ours. So thank you again and have a great day.